think about death and get sad and stuff. Dude, what's up? How's it going? Cameron? How's it going? How's, how are you today? I'm pretty good, man. You, uh, you know, you're full. Yeah, I'm, I've had a sandwich. I'm good. That's good. Okay, so here I'm gonna go into the intro here, and then we're gonna start chatting casually and <laughs> you know stuff like that. We just gotta set up our show. You know what I'm saying? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty too. Hey everyone, Cameron here. Welcome to the second episode of Framework, a film-centric podcast and YouTube show about how single frames in popular films speak to the rest of the film as a whole. On this show, producers, writers, directors, and cinematographers break down films and dig deeper into the art form as a medium for storytelling in this modern world. So what's up? I mean... I mean, I didn't I mean, sleep last night. I didn't really... I mean, I slept. I slept more than you did. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I was watching. You were watching me sleep. Yeah, that's why I didn't sleep last night. Oh. No, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I'm just going to jump into a little bit of recap. Okay. If you don't mind, Kevin. Sure. Just really quickly. Please remind me. I can't remember things because I didn't sleep. That's a good idea. Yeah. I think we're just going to jump right into a quick little recap. All right. So okay. for those of you who skipped the pilot episode, we talked about the 2019 film Joker directed by Todd Phillips and featured Robin Johnston, a cinematographer from Toronto. And just a reminder, my name is Cameron. I'm a writer-producer focusing on all kinds of content. I've produced four award-winning short films, and I'm currently de developing a feature script. Today, we're going to talk about Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, thanks to Mr. Kevin DeRoos, who's here with us today. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Are you asking me, or are you asking the audience? Everybody is. Are you, are you, you, everybody includes you. Okay, well, I'm great. I'm fantastic. That's great. That's great. So we are here in the Red Curtain should Entertainment we, offices. Should we jump into like a little bit of ASMR? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Because we gotta go. We gotta talk close to the mic because should we do? Because the computer's very loud. Dude, look. You. I mean, I helped a little bit. What? But you built this studio. Yeah. In your backyard, basically. We and built this city. We built this city. Uh, no, copyright. Oh, shit. <laughs> but, uh, you, you built this in your backyard. I helped you clear it out. I had back pains for a week because of it. Now I have shin splints. And uh, we're recording, and we found out that uh, your computer's got the default fans in it, so they're not quiet. They're pretty fucking loud. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we might have to try and phase it out. It's pretty consistently at a, at a certain frequency, though. So I have the CPU fan that came with the CPU, so I didn't buy it. I Silent you know what we'll have to do is when we start making money from this podcast, we'll have yeah. to start. We'll have to buy a new fan. Yeah, yeah. Does that yeah. sound like a good idea? Sounds like a good. Sounds idea. like a good idea. Yeah. So, yeah. just for everybody listening today, the quality of our audio is going to be a little bit lessened in comparison to the first episode. Just bear with us uh, as best you can. I think for this episode, I'm going to put markers in the YouTube description. I don't know how to do that. You know, not oh, yet. You, you, you just put, you just write down the timestamps. So, okay, cool. And so, what I might do is write down the timestamps. If you want to skip over a couple things and not listen to us for an hour, I completely understand. But make sure that you listen to the meat and potatoes, because we're going to talk about an awesome film called Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, thanks to Mr. Kevin Drews. Kevin, is this your favorite film? Uh, it's one of my favorite films. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one great, of mine now. Yeah, it's a great so. film. Yeah, you, I'm surprised you haven't seen it until last week dude i know like what is going on especially we'll have to get a, into that a toronto film too um i know 2010 as well so so you know we can jump into this really quick but before we do that i just want to introduce you or i want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are i mean if you're a watcher of red curtain entertainment or dr masaki you pretty well know who kevin derus is but just tell me a little bit about yourself. What I've got written here is that you're Kevin, mm -hmm. you're a YouTuber, an editor, and a filmmaker. Oh, yeah. Is that a pretty good... You're also like a musician, a VFX artist. And, yeah, I don't know who you know, I am. Who, how do you... You know, <laughs> was this a is this podcast framework episode do going to turn into like an identity thing? Yeah, it's going to be my identity <laughs> just, crisis. Right so just, just tell me what you do currently. And we'll kind of go from there. So, well, yeah, go, like, just start there. Well, currently I'm editing a videos for James, the box office artist. Ooh, uh, shout out. 
shout out. He's a uh, he's he he's a VFX artist, and a, uh, he was also working for Marvel as a comic book artist. Wow, so, nice. Um, and you're editing videos for his channel. So I'm editing videos for his YouTube channel. Nice. And I'm also nice. making YouTube videos on my own channel with Cameron. Yeah, awesome. Since uh, 2011. Yeah, we've been doing it for a while. I mean, you've been doing it with like Tim and uh, yeah, a couple other people YouTube, for like yeah. a bit longer and before YouTube. Mm-hmm. You and I met in, in seventh grade. I mean, we knew yeah. each other in sixth grade. But we kind of really started hanging out and doing like those haunted videos and, and the Kapla and Kapla montage and like the the grade eight sleepover thing where yeah. Vincent and I to this day still call each other an asshole, asshole, asshole. And so that's a that's a joke. But um, but yeah, we've been hanging out for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, we, um, we've, we've made a film called Blue Inflatable Ball. Yeah, Part the Blue two Inflatable in Ball series, twenty eleven, yeah. dude. That's an great. epic. That's an epic series, man. You can also find Speechless. I made Speechless Part Four. Yeah, Part Four. Part oh, and you could one, two, three, three, three and a half, half, four, and then including some other teaser trailers yeah, in there. Promos, you got about yeah. sixty minutes of content, probably. Yeah, so. and we worked on that together. So. Yeah. yeah. So we've done a lot of good good stuff. We got stuff planned, including this podcast, including Kevin's plan to do videos every week. He also helped me out on the sizzle that Robin uh, plugged last episode, the Run Boy Run sizzle. Mm -hmm. And we want to turn that into a short film and eventually a feature film. And Kevin's going to help out with that. Yes. So that's our little intro for you, Kevin. I mean, would you consider the Bet Japan series as well? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a big documentary it's vlog. It's kind of like series. a documentary vlog. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a huge series. We can link all of this in the it's description. It's a project too, right? So, that's a huge project. Yeah. And we want to go back to Japan, hopefully by the beginning of next year. Yeah. Because or the first quarter of next year, as soon as possible. Yeah, basically as soon as. It would be nice to do like the same block of time again. But maybe oh, even May, May. maybe even like before we left, so we we could maybe catch like the, March, April. Yeah, so we could catch the the, the cherry blossoms. The cherry blossoms. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah, that'd be sick. Um, so we're gonna do that next year. Mm-hmm. That's that's already in the calendar. That's in the calendar. as of right now. Yep. Um, but yeah, just a reminder of how the show works. We release episodes once every month, ideally on the first Monday of every month. Um, but since this is our own only like our second episode. We're still working out kinks. We're still working out how it's going to be produced. But one thing will remain the same, and that is that we will always be talking about movies, TV shows, YouTube shows, short films, etc., etc., etc. Today, we just happen to be talking about a film, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Um, and I am going to go into a one to two minute summary of scott program versus the world hopefully it'll be less than that so by the way there will there may be spoilers throughout the episode so if you want if you're listening and you're about here you're safe because you haven't we haven't spoiled anything yet but i am going to read the summary of the film that i wrote not too long ago to get to give you guys an idea of what scott program versus the world is and if you have not seen the film go watch the film and then come back and listen i think that's a fair assumption yeah. We don't know what we're going to say because we're recording this together and we don't have a script, but... But you're going to edit it. We're going to edit it, and if we start talking and it's spoiling, I'm sorry, but it's going to go in the episode. Right. So go watch the movie. You've had 10 years to watch the movie. Yeah. Go it's, watch it. There's already the 10-year anniversary. It's already the 10-year ten, ten anniversary. All right, here we go. Scott Program is an action-packed Roman... Ma- <laughs> dude, oh, I didn't even get to the S's dude, and I fucked it up. Dude, okay. okay. <laughs> Scott Pilgrim is an action-packed romantic comedy adventure film with notes of magical pseudo-supernatural superhero science based on a graphic novel by Canadian Brian Lee O'Malley featuring a gang of young adults that have their very own indie punk rock band called the Sex Bobombs. Now that's a mouthful. That, dude, that was a great sentence, though. Yeah, oh my god. <laughs> it was Did way too long, but that? it was... Yeah, no, I, I just gave up with that. That was... <laughs> I didn't pre-write that at all. Their musical goal is to make you think about death and feel sad and stuff. And apparently they're all garbage trucks, but you can take my word for it. They aren't actually garbage. 
The bassist and our protagonist, Scott Pilgrim, played by an awkwardly hysterical version of Michael Cera, starts out dating a 17-year-old high schooler named Knives Chow. What a name. No, yeah. Right? Uh, Knives Chow. Of course... He receives criticism from his band of friends, sister, and gay roommate for being five years older than she is. As the film progresses, we slowly learn more and more about Pilgrim's past, especially of his past girlfriend who goes by the name Envy. Perhaps what complicates his life and current relationship with Knives more than anything is the introduction of Ramona Flowers, whom he quickly falls for. Following their introduction, Pilgrim romances Ramona and struggles to break up with Knives. And if this is not enough drama for one movie, Scott soon learns that Ramona has seven deadly exes who are out to destroy him, resulting in battles to the death and a fallout that comes as a result. Wow. So I wrote that not too long ago just as as kind of my revised summary of what I read on IMDb. Yeah. Because IMDb does a good job of concisely writing out kind of what a film is about. Mm Mm-hmm. But there's a bit more color in this summary that I think I like. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Now, would you agree with that summary? Would you want to add anything else, Kevin? No, it sums it up. I mean, it's it's very. Uh, it follows the comic book very well. Um, it's, it's, it's it's visually it's different from any other any other uh, young adult film. Mm -hmm, definitely oh yeah and i wrote an extended overview slash review of this film Mm -hmm. which i have not published yet but the uh basically the the point the the review basically comments on how like colorful the the film is and how um you know maybe i haven't read the comic or the graphic the graphic novel but Mm -hmm how reminiscent of a graphic novel it really is and edgar wright really brings his his power uh of sort of his magic magical power of filmmaking yeah. to create this film yeah which i think which i think is wonderful but framework's not necessarily about the film as a whole it's about how frames, frames. connect to the film as a whole so right. kevin you're our guest today because you teased Scott Pilgrim on our last episode. Oh my goodness. And like we said earlier, we're good friends. What frame or scene would you like to talk about? Well, there's that frame that stuck out uh, quite a bit. I thought when I when I first saw the movie, I thought it was hilarious. Like I uh, cuz all over, all over Toronto there's there's pedestrian x signs all mm-hmm. over the place right and with the yellow x lights you know crossing lights ab- above the streets and what what uh was the who was the cinematographer or um anyways the um in in one shot in one of the shots um after scott learns about having the he has to battle seven x's mm-hmm. he's walking underneath these uh the pedestrian crossing signs and there's seven x's in the frame there's exactly above, seven all around him yeah and i thought that would, i thought that blew my mind the first time i saw it i'm like this is that's so creative that's amazing cinematography by bill pope bill pope Yeah, you know, this, I I know the frame that you're talking about, and for the viewers who are on YouTube, that frame is up Mm -hmm. on screen right now. It's not on Um, our screen, though. No, but it's about to be. There you go. Yeah. Um, If you do want to watch the film, I would recommend that you wait till the theatrical release if you're in Canada. But if you're in the States, congratulations, you're all vaccinated, you can go to the movies. (laughs) Um, The, the, we, we watched this together on Amazon uh, stars um stars tv or whatever the hell fuck it's called but uh but yeah this this frame stood out to me as well and i noticed right away that there were seven x's in this frame yeah you know two on the sides and then five above his head mm-hmm. and you mentioned something about where he's positioned and where the x's are what was that when we talked about oh, this oh, um, he, yeah he's directly underneath it because he's uh, i guess um oppressed He's yeah yeah definitely he's uh, he's thinking about it it's on his mind yeah and it's all surrounding his mind the all the X's 
Yeah, and you know what? That's that's something that cinematography in general with you know with other films not not just this one uh it, they it, it accomplishes you know mm-hmm. i mean cinematography is a is a big it's a visual language right yeah. and that that that's it is the medium it's a not a medium but um yeah the tool that the filmmakers use mm-hmm. um to bring the story to life visually speaking and and to show what the characters are and, thinking right? and to show exactly what the character is is yeah. thinking and and I mean, this is Toronto, and they they obviously filmed during winter months because there's snow all over the place. Actually, they filmed this in April, and they they added the snow. What? Wow. Uh, there was like behind the scenes. They start. I think they started filming in the winter, but it was like. They, Wait. They, so, are, is this snow fake? Yeah, there was. I think there was like fake snow for some scenes, but I think this snow is fake too. Dude, that's unbelievable! It looks so fucking realistic. Yeah. <laughs> And that that's interesting. You you're kind of bringing that uh, a perspective of more knowledge about the film because you saw it sooner than I did. Mm-hmm. Also, a visual effects perspective. I would not have guessed that this is that this snow is fake. Yeah. Some of it's got to be real. Well, yeah, I I'm not sure if this this scene okay. was I remember seeing uh behind the scenes and they were adding snow. I could be wrong. They might have to fact, fact check. Fact check that. Fact check. Fact check. Yeah, fact check. Fact so does that well, mean you're gonna go more. fact check it, or I should, I should, let's go? Want to go fact check? Yeah, go fact check it for me. Uh, but yeah, no, that that's that's really interesting. I mean, I mean, there's a lot. Like, for example, in Canada, we do a lot of uh, Hallmark films um, for the states, and um, well, also for Canada. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, the interesting thing about it is that we shoot basically all of these Christmas movies. Yeah. In the summer months. Right. So all the snow is practical. Basically all the snow is practical. Yeah. Um and then some is visual effects, but there's not a huge budget for visual effects. So they try and capture as much as they can on screen um as possible. Uh but but yeah, I mean it's really interesting. I mean, if they started filming and then the snow kind of disappeared and for continuity reasons, they had to keep snow, then it would make sense that they would have to yeah, the, to put VFX into it. Um, but yeah, so you got a couple of frames here. Let's talk about this one for a little bit. Okay. Um, is there something about this frame? This one? That um, aside from the this um, compositional oppression... Mm-hmm. that's going on that you want to talk about or do you want to just dive into the composition of this frame um or do, or is there something else that you want to talk about for we know framework is meant to be really diverse so there's lots of topics that we can talk about but if there's one in particular that's on your mind we'll jump right into that i don't sure, know about you could, but yeah, i can, can hear like a grass cutter like oh, i can hear a someone's lawn. mowing their lawn jeez dude Toronto. welcome to the red curtain entertainment Outdoor. Oh, every time we're trying to studio. film something, there's always there's always, always something someone counting their grass. It's Unreal. okay. I've heard I've heard podcasts with shittier quality. So, <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, I'm not even joking. There's <laughs> like there's some podcasts out there, like true crime podcasts. Yeah, where like they give you a whole bunch of warnings about their audio quality, but like they go out into the field. Yeah, and. They go to the now the noisiest parts of town to record these interviews, and you can barely hear what the people are saying. So the narrator has to come into a studio and repeat everything that the person said. Boy. <laughs> so uh, there is worse out there. Trust me. That's uh, well, I guess it's all about the content. I yeah, that's right. I can't find it. I don't know. I don't know where it is, Cameron. I'm sorry. That's okay. We don't have to. We don't have to talk too much about that. Snow looks fake, though. In this shot, I've seen a lot of snow in Toronto. And well, you went to school in Toronto. That's true. Probably close by to where this was filmed. To be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about composition, because it really is an interesting thing. Going, um, there's a really interesting thing going on in this frame, and. Can you just pull up the film for me? I think the snow's fake because snowbanks don't look like that in Toronto. No. Well, they, usually that's like piled up on the yeah. side. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
Maybe what he's walking on is not fake. It is fake. But the oh, but the sidewalks are. Maybe. Because I would feel like the sidewalks would be cleared in Toronto before the road. Yeah, and for something to be, if it was in April, they'd, you, it's you a lot would have, of snow. You, you, would have, you would have more snow banks. And yeah. Interesting. Um, but yeah, let's jump into talking about, I think composition would be cool. And, and we it's can, symmetrical. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. It is symmetrical. And there's there's lots of symmetry going on in this frame. Um, do you want to just remind our audience where this frame is in the film? Can we pull it up on Amazon to find like oh, how many minutes about, in? It's about in the middle of the film. Um, let's let's pull that up. Oh. Here we go. About fifty four minutes in the film. So about fifty four minutes into the film, we how many X's have we seen him battle? Two, two so far. So and there are two on two on the signs. This is and about. Then there are Four or five left on top of them. The, see, there's so much more going on <laughs> visually that, like, as indicators where if this if this film or sorry if this scene was shot differently, yeah. you wouldn't have seen this. You could they they could have easily ignored the signs. Yeah, but somebody made the conscious decision to include them. Well, I think they did. They did add those signs in there because normally there's just one yellow blinking light above the street. Not there's yes. Not five this is this is not. Yeah, that's an average one or two. Yeah, but not fine. <laughs> so they definitely did add those. Um, so now, yeah, let's let's talk about that symmetry a little bit more, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, what what were you thinking? No, I think yeah, I think the uh, so first of all, the the fact that he's in the center brings our focus. Right. Okay. So the signs, while they're an excellent addition to this uh, to this frame to this scene, the focus is on him, mm-hmm. right? And 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 that I think brings apart brings about this this symmetry because obviously, um, if he wasn't walking in the middle, then there would be a break of that symmetry. Yeah. Um, assuming the shot would remain the same. Mm. So and and the fact that he's already battled two exes mm-hmm. right he's met ramona he's battled two exes um he's had to break up with knives right like right. these these are all not so good things i mean you break up with your girlfriend and mm-hmm. then you find somebody else and she kind of provides a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for you and then you realize she comes with all this baggage yeah and so that's not good so he's sort of approaching a low point where he feels like there's things are coming down on top of him and mm. the world is is sort of um, n- uh, less within his control, mm-hmm. um, right? Protagonists and characters, they like to be they like to be in control. And I think in this case, the symmetry and the fact that he's in the center and the fact that he's buried by this archway of X's shows, very visually and very evocatively that he's losing a little bit of control Mm -hmm. and um you know we we see that through not just what michael Sarah is um emoting but from the cinematographer's vantage point uh it also seems like the you know the camera is uh, positioned sort of below him like it's not it's pretty low to the ground it's pretty low to the ground like it's not at it's not at eye line, right? Yeah. And and um, you know, I mean, some people might argue that you know we we use that angle to show that this character has dominance. Mm-hmm. So maybe they're using the camera in a way to provide us with a feeling of yes, he's being buried by these exes, but there's a little bit of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's sort of like a. It's sort of like a middle of the road frame. You know, there's a little bit of depression in there. Yeah. Like there's a little bit of, you know, pessimism and, and sadness. And I'm at a low point and I, I can't get out and I, I'm going to lose this girl forever feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's five X's above him, which remind you how many X's there are left to go. Yeah. You know, but we're also shooting it from below. So he's the dominant 
he he's dominating the camera. Yeah. Okay, the camera is not dominating him. So maybe there's a little bit of strength still in him, right? Yeah. And something I mentioned in my overview of the film is that, you know, um we like we have to sympathize with him and we have to understand from a writer's perspective and from an audience's perspective that what he is fighting for is worth it. Yeah. And I think Ramona is worth it. Like to him. Right. She came into his life or he came into hers and then he fought for him as, as easy as it was to kind of win her over. Mm -hmm. Right. Spoiler. Like <laughs> yeah. as easy as it was to convince her to go on a date with him. Like he did. Yeah. You know, um, but but yeah, I think. But now he's stressed. Now he's now, upset. Now he's stressed and upset, and he's got to he's got to you know destroy these remaining five X's. Yeah. Um, now, perhaps the use of symmetry, and the fact that there's kind of two feelings: a feeling of hope and dominance, and a feeling of depression and sadness coming together. Mm -hmm. I think the symmetry is a choice that. Um, harks back to that, that right. reminds us of that. Yeah. We're putting him in the center because these two emotions and feelings are meeting, mm -hmm. are meeting in the center. And he's the center of, of this Scott program versus the world universe that's pseudo superficial, like pseudo, you know, scientific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, but so that's kind of maybe my small interpretation of this frame. What do you think? No, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you're... You're a lot better at this than I am, but uh, yeah, I mean, also like the I love, I love how the the just like the trees, I mean, they're they're kind of like they're they're all just all on top of them. It draws the eyes, like just like they. I don't know how you explain, but you know, they ju it's just it just it adds. It's just a, it's just a great frame, you know. I just you know I just like looking at it. You just like it's just it's pretty. It's pretty. It's just pretty. It's pretty. It, it 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 says a lot about you know how he's feeling and what's going on in the definitely, scene. Definitely, definitely. Like, where it is in the movie. And so. do you, what do you think? What do you think of of sort of what it shows about the setting about Toronto? Whether the snow's fake or not, mm -hmm. like do you think it's a do you think it's a natural, realistic painting of of Toronto? Like, is this something that you oh, yeah. would see when you're walking through the suburbs of Toronto? Oh yeah, this is definitely a Toronto suburb. And really. you, and I mean, as somebody from Toronto, we know that. But you know, if somebody from New York or whatever who's never been to Toronto, maybe New York's a bad example. Mm. If somebody from California who's never been to Toronto were to come and walk around Toronto and was a big fan of Scott Pilgrim, they'd be like, oh, Scott Pilgrim was totally filmed here. Like, you get the feeling of Scott Pilgrim yeah, yeah. and the setting of Toronto in this... You really get the feeling of Toronto frame. in this film. In the in the whole film. In the whole film. Yeah. Um, but I think this... You know, the idea... It, it's sort of... There's so many different things merging. So many things that appear as opposites are merging in this in this frame at this time mm -hmm. of the movie and at this time of uh, Scott's basically journey. Yeah. His journey, right? The Another thing that's kind of, you know, colliding mm -hmm. is the tone of the film has changed from something that is a bit more natural, mm -hmm. okay, realistic, to something that's a bit more like comic, really in-your-face comic booky. Yeah. Like of course the the beginning of the film there are subtle nuances that Edgar Wright chooses to use like with the like with the on-screen graphics of introducing the characters, mm -hmm. you know, the the title sequence, the 8-bit universal logo, the subtitles, the yeah. subtitles, okay? Those are little things in in Wright's toolkit that he uses to kind of allude to its to his audience. Like, we're in a fucking comic book. Yeah. Okay. Now as somebody myself who hadn't seen the film before, I didn't really pick up on those. But then he meets the first X, which is I think about 30 minutes into the film. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we know we're in a fucking graphic novel yeah. because like all of a sudden Scott Pilgrim's got powers that you didn't think <laughs> he had unless yeah. you've seen the gra unless you've read the graphic novel. Yeah. 
So something that I think is happening here is... And he is, kills them in front of everybody and nobody cares. And nobody cares. They just go back to playing music. Yeah. <laughs> um, the music's great in this film, by the way. Um, and the music in most Edgar Wright films is, is great. Oh, yeah. But what's happening here is we've made that tonal shift. Mm-hmm. And yet there aren't any magically comic booky elements to this frame. Right. There's no graphics. There's no like otherworldly elements to this scene, this frame. Mm-hmm. It's just him and it's just a painting of his life with a couple of extra axes above his head. Yeah. Um and that and that is interlaced into the film in between moments of magical realism. So I think that's also happening here. Is there Does, anything else you want to add about this frame? Uh, he has a nice coat. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it is a nice. It's probably like a three hundred dollar coat. Oh yeah, and he's got an X on it as well. No shit. It's got a patch. Well, it's on the shoulder. It shows in the next frame that he takes it up. But. Dude, there's X's everywhere. Oh yeah, see how many find it. Let's see how many X's you can like. We find. Ev- like we even like crossing drumsticks. Yeah, the the crossing. They do the that in the movie. Yeah. yeah, in the movie. Yeah, there's X's everywhere. There's there's the one in the beginning that was foreshadowing of the. Um, uh, let's see if I can pull it up. In the very beginning. Oh, literally everything is foreshadowed. It's very great. Holy fuck! <laughs> with the with the. With the paths of the snow in the snow, make it make a cross, dude. And there's also a sound effect that plays when they show it. Sees like a just a little bit of an ominous sound effect, like ominous ambience that reminds you, like yeah, it's like oh, this is foreshadowing. Now, that's a good that's a good question. I mean, we're moving away from cinematography a little bit, but that's totally okay because I think framework is, you know. The idea behind framework is, is yes, it's how a single frame um, translates to the bigger picture and, um, and how it speaks to the picture uh, overall. But mm-hmm. it's okay, I think, because framework is evolving and we're, you know, this is only the second episode, so we had no idea where this, mo- where this uh, podcast would go and, and whatnot. So I think it's great that this podcast is evolving with episodes over time. Mm-hmm. But I think... It's also really good that one frame sparks so much discussion. Yeah. Okay. So, moving on to the second frame that you've that you've pulled up yeah, um, with the with the, the the other one. Sorry, the second the, the snow the, the snow one, path. One the snow. Moving on to this frame just for a second, knowing that Scott Pilgrim and Knives are in the center of, of the path, not in the center of the frame, mm-hmm. and the path is an X. Yeah. Right. What do you think this is foreshadowing? Are we foreshadowing the the entirety of the storyline with how the X's play in? Or is going to cross we, paths? Are we, yeah, are we what are we foreshadowing? Cuz there's so many things because there's so many uses of the X's. Yeah. Ramona's X's, right? The actual like battles themselves, mm-hmm. right? An X is kind of like, you know, symbolizing something being wrong or something being destroyed Mm -hmm. so are we foreshadowing the end of their relationship maybe or are we foreshadowing the battles themselves like what do you think is happening here it's interesting i mean i'm I'm, i was also thinking like you know it's 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 like they're on a path they're on paths and and you know he can. He, there's like a in the end he has to decide whether to go to Ramona or Knives. Right. And spoiler. You know, there's two different. Yeah, those are spoilers. But <laughs> that's okay. it's like a two different paths that kind of cross, right? Yeah. And that's that also can be interpreted as that. Um, there's so many interpretations. The other thing that I'm noticing is that they're not walking left to right. They're walking right to left. Yeah. Which in a North American audience it's, it's unnatural. is unnatural and regret and and symbolizes regression. Yeah, right. Which is happening between him and knives. Mm-hmm. Right, the beginning of the film, right, yeah. with him and knives, they're they have this like great idealistic relationship. Mm. You know, which it's just going to be destroyed. 
Yeah. And I mean, the, the fact that there's an X, the fact that there's paths, the fact that they're walking right to left just shows the downward slope of this relationship. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I think you're right. I think it's the, the fact that they are paths. Yeah, is more important than maybe the fact that there there's an X there, but the X. You're right. The path does go down downward. Downward, yeah. Visually, yeah. Visually, yeah. yeah. Now, do you think bringing it back to the cinematography, you know, knowing how cameras work and and how how cinematographers place cameras? I mean, I don't know how this film, how this scene is shot. It could be in a helicopter or a drone or, or something. Put it on a crane or a crane. Or, yeah. Now, they could have leveled this shot. Yeah. They could have leveled they, it. They could have just been going straight from right from right to left. That's right. But they didn't. They kind of angled it so they're they're kind of going downwards. Yeah. Just like the relationship. You see what cinematography <laughs> can do, man? It's amazing. You see what cinemat You see what happens in great films where the cinematography supports the story and the script. Mhm. That's amazing, right? Yeah. It's just something as simple as this. It's like it's such a s- simple shot. Yeah. But it has so much meaning. It does. And, uh, yeah, it's like place at the beginning and it just foreshadows the rest of the film. And like you said, there's just so many X's placed throughout the whole film. I mean, we could sit here for two hours and watch the whole film and point out all the X's that we see. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had a third, you had a third frame. Well, yeah, this is a little bit different. I mean, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but I noticed that throughout the film, they... They used a uh, countdown uh, throughout, and like they this this game that they're playing uh, throughout the film. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if this is really more of a uh, um, cinematography kind of thing, because it's also like the the voiceover of the guy doing the countdown, right? Um, you can talk a little bit about sound if you want. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just I mean, visually, just looking at it there. I mean, he. Uh, I'm, when, when was when was this? I think he was. Uh, he wants to break up with her, right? At this point, this is when he and he had to think, and then there was a countdown. And, oh, and this I, is. Like, is like this where he like decides to go solo? Well, no, it's after after he. After Nega and Ninja, he 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 was t- he's told to break up with her that day. Um, and spoiler alert, he breaks up with her after this scene. But y- you think he's gonna break up with her there, because he's like I think. Um, he's about to say it. Yeah. And there's the countdown. And it's can funny we watch fun- the scene? Yeah, we can watch it. If we watch it without us, we can cut it out later. But yeah, yeah. Because I think, if I remember correctly, basically what happens in this game that they're playing is after the countdown, you have to decide whether or not to go solo or as a team. Yeah. So the fact that he decides solo means that one of them dances by themselves and it just sort of shows that they're separating. Yeah, and like also there's a continue with a question mark. Continue? Yeah, continue it's with a question mark. It's not just the game. It could be their continue the relationship. So uh, visually, they're they're basically... <laughs> visually, they are reminding us as many times as they possibly can that he needs to either continue the relationship or break up with her. Yeah. Oh, this is not when he breaks up with her. This is... Uh, it was when he was thinking about it because he's already f- met Ramona. He's supposed to break up with her, but he didn't do it. I think it's good. I think it's a good. Like it's a great scene though because yeah. he she literally asks him, "Do you want to continue?" Yeah, do you want to continue? But yeah. it's, he's he's thinking about their relationship. That's right. And I just like how it's he placed that in between them to continue with the question mark with the countdown. Well, yeah, and I think it's very much a cinematography thing, like a cinematic yeah. thing, because there's so much space in between them, and they're cut off at the backs. Yeah. Like it's not a comfortable frame to look at. Right, yeah. And it's completely intentional. Mm-hmm. So your focus is not on either one of them. Your focus is on the the graphic behind it. Yeah. So I mean that's a that's a cinematography choice. Yeah. That's a decision that Edgar Wright made with his cinematographer Bill Pope. Right. Yeah, and like how how he's on a time limit as well. Yeah. You know, he's with he's Yeah, already, I mean, he's already 
started dating Ramona too. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I guess, yeah, he's never really physical with either one of them necessarily, all, but, except for in his dreams, but. Yeah, but the longer he waits, you know, the worse he gets, right? That's right. The so. more tempting it becomes and the more difficult it is. And, yeah. Yeah. So. In this case, I think the 10, you know, they used 10 because they didn't want to bring in seven or five or four. You know, I think 10, I think this is symbolic of, of how much time he has, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's not of the X's. Like there's probably some X's in this in this scene. Yeah. Like I don't know what else is in the scene, but there's probably some X's there somewhere. There probably is somewhere, yeah. There's an X. Where? Well, I mean in the game. See I mean there's just a small little X's part of the game when he says bad. But I guess that's irrelevant. Yeah, I mean that was probably right Yeah. But I mean they are ninjas fighting. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so but yeah, I mean that's uh, that's uh, it's an interesting frame. Um, yeah, I think they they're all interesting frames. They they're all kind of in the first half of the movie. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. So it's in, it's it would be interesting to find some some frames, kind of like maybe near the the second half of the movie to sort of see how the cinematography um, changes or? changes over the course of the film with his progression and his transition into kind of eliminating these X's one by one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't have to find too many more frames. Yeah. So I think, you know, framework is evolving into a podcast that will forever be film centric. We'll talk about TV shows. We'll talk about movies. We'll talk about other sorts of content as well. If we ever find a short film, yeah, what with about a frame. games, grant games, we could talk about games, games too. We could talk about games have frames. Yeah. Games have frames. Game video games have that's a tag have line right there. Have cinematics. So have cutscenes. Yeah. So you know, if you seek a movie with a good story about teenage angsty relationships, but also packs some sort of action and comedy, you know, I promise you, if Michael Sarah does not win over Ramona's heart by the end of it, he'll win over yours. <laughs> so that that's kind of where where I'm at with this with this wow. film. Did you just come up with that? Oh, it's in my review. Oh, okay. um, but Ramona did it for me, though. I mean, like, I feel yeah. like I feel like a lot of dudes just need a Ramona, like, in their lives, you know. Oh yeah. Like I feel I feel like Ramona is this, I don't know, like spunky sort of young adult female character that sort of just, you know, spices up everybody's lives. You know, she's mm -hmm. spontaneous, changes her hair like every week and a half. You know. Yeah. You know, so I think. I think there's some really great stuff about this film that almost anybody, you know, whether or not you've seen the, you've read the comic, the graphic novel, mm -hmm. um, you could get something out of it, you know. Okay. Um, Steven Spielberg once said that a movie cannot rely only on its attractive effects to win over the audience. It first and foremost requires a relatable, lovable, and universal story. Exactly. He was, of course, right, yeah. as Spielberg is normally. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is a perfect example. Yeah, it wasn't It wasn't just all VFX. No, and, and no, there's something there, you yeah, know. Yeah, there's and, actually there. And some movies can suffer from just being spectacles, like visual effects spectacles. Yeah, you just know, a bunch of visuals. Just a bunch of visuals, exactly, you know. Um, there's so much to say about this this film. I mm. really don't think we could do it in one framework episode. Mm. You know, I don't even think I would be able to sum up or write out everything that that goes through my head after I finish watching this movie. Yeah. And I mean, it was really interesting to watch this movie for the first time for me yeah. because I'd never seen the trailer. Yeah, that's right. I yeah, never you, read you the thought. graphic novel. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that it was based on intellectual like additional intellectual property i thought it was like an original screenplay yeah and like the, the especially the first scene when uh, the first ex matthew patel yeah flies, i was like what the fuck is going in. on you were you were so confused yeah i thought you know with i wrote i wrote a little bit more about this in my in my review but with the first scene of the film like i mean so 
the universal logo comes in and it's like 8 bit you yeah, know yeah, yeah. so it's like okay they're going to take on some sort of gamer style you know yeah. like so that's it's a great style you know keep up with the gamer style mm-hmm. it went over right over my head okay fine <laughs> so we, then we go into the film and they're at this dinner table the five of them or four of them like the bandmates mm-hmm. are around this dinner table talking about his 17 year old high school girlfriend mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, here we go. We're we're going into this romantic drama, comedy thing yeah. about teenage angst, yeah, uh, featuring Michael Sarah. Yeah. So I'm like, this is going to be a subdued perks of being a wallflower. Juno. Okay, Juno. Yeah. So it's going to be subdued. Yeah. All right. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> like. Edgar Wright introduces all these characters with these on on screen text boxes mm-hmm. that are reminiscent of like of graphic novels. Mm-hmm. I still didn't catch on. Yeah. Right. So there there and then on screen effects like the streaking from the drumsticks. Yeah. Okay. I still didn't catch on. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the first X shows up, and they're battling, and it's like oh. This is the type of film that we're in. <laughs> like, this is the kind of movie we're watching. Yeah. This is not Juno. This is not Perks of Being a Wallflower. This yeah. is something completely fucking different <laughs> that, that is so refreshing, you know? Mm-hmm. There, was a, there was a twist in the film that moved over, um, that moved, that it literally changed for me. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been a change if I had known coming into it what to expect. Yeah. But there was a change for me. Mm -hmm. The expectation was basically crushed with a boulder. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think... Well, I guess that's good that you didn't watch the trailer. Yeah. It's a a much bigger surprise. It is. It it was an excellent viewing experience. And I really wish we could watch it in theaters. Because, I mean, they upresed it to 4K. They mastered it at Adobe Atmos. Yeah. For like the 10-year anniversary, 11 years now. And Edgar Wright is like a big believer in how this movie was meant for the the silver screen, like the big screen. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think we should all be watching movies on the big screen. I think it's, it's a very refreshing and wonderful experience to be in a theater with an audience and watching something on a massive screen. Yeah. We should go sometime. We should. Yeah. Yeah, we should record, record a podcast in the theater. Yeah. while it's being <laughs> while, we're, while we're watching the movie like while the movie's playing in front of us yeah yeah what was your first viewing experience like i mean you probably saw it closer yeah. to when it came out uh, yeah did you like, read like the in, comic it's like in high school i read the comic afterwards okay but it's it was on it was online it was i found it for free but yeah i probably uh, there was also now, like right? an animation for it and there's a video game too and then yeah there's a video game um oh yeah i know what i was gonna do i was gonna do our little sponsor spot oh yeah who's it today hey cameron who's our sponsor today our, our sponsor for every episode is the same company and it's your company it's red curtain, <laughs> curtain entertainment. entertainment this podcast yeah. is brought to you by red curtain entertainment and is filmed in part and in the rca studios north of toronto following COVID 19 yeah, guidelines they are nice enough to lend us this studio that we we're recording yeah i mean it's your studio and you <laughs> built it so yeah i mean well, it was really fitting to have you know, Robin come in on the first one to have a, a, a practicing cinematographer on our first episode for a film like Joker, which is obviously completely different from Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> yes. And then come in on episode two and talk about Scott Pilgrim versus the world, which is a complete 180. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, so are we going to do a 360? Are we going to do it? Are we going to do a 360? Yeah. I was going to ask you, what movie should we talk about next? Like, I mean, we... we, we Dunkirk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, no. We could talk about Gun Gunkirk. Gun fucking Gunkirk. Gun no, Kirk. Dunkirk. We could talk about Gun Dunkirk. Um I was thinking we could talk about there's two movies I was thinking that was on my mind. Um and they would they would both sort of start to bring us closer to that middle ground between Joker and Scott Pilgrim. Okay. So I wanted to talk about Pirates of the Caribbean. The oh, first, right, yeah. The, the first Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I also had in mind to talk about uh, Apollo 13, the Tom Hanks Apollo 13. Right. So have you seen both of those films? 
Yes. Well, the, which pirates? I think I think I've seen the, it. I've the seen it. the first it. pirates. Yeah, yeah, I've seen. Um, Curse of the Black Pearl. I think I've seen all of them. But it was yeah, a I mean, it was a while ago. Pirates of the Caribbean like, just starts going downhill after the third movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the first three. The first three are good, and then four just sort of fucks everything up. Yeah. Like, yeah, what the fuck are you doing, Disney? You're, you're, yeah. what the fuck? And then they made Lone Ranger. And then they made Lone Ranger. Which I haven't seen, but I assume it's kind of like Pirates, but in in the Wild West. Uh, yeah, so. I think okay. one of those two movies. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Who, should we tease it or should we just I don't know. Well, keep are we it a get, surprise? Are we going to get another guest? Well, I don't know. I mean, or you know what? They can also suggest in the comments below. Yeah, suggest it in the comments below. Yeah, give me your give me your spiel, Kevin. My spiel. Yeah. Did you write anything? For what? I mean, this is the Red Curtain Entertainment spot. So, I mean, and you're the what kind of spiel? Spiel? Yeah, the Red Curtain Entertainment spiel. Spielberg. Tell me, tell me where people can find your content. Oh, uh, they can find it on YouTube and. On Instagram. <laughs> they can find it on YouTube and Instagram. I'm on DVD <laughs> and on Facebook. Coming soon to, to Disney, Disney DVD. DVD. Uh, no, I, I think uh, uh, yeah, YouTube.com slash Dr. Masaki, D-R-M-A-S-A-K-I. And uh, same, same thing for Instagram. I mean, you can find it on the RCE Podcasts YouTube channel as well. If you're yeah. if you're listening, watching to this on YouTube, you can yeah. find it on the featured channels section. Yeah, would I even be considered a, a guest? I don't even know. At, like, you know, at this point, at this point, it's like you own us. Yeah. You're the owner of this podcast, dude. Yeah, I'm just the producer. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say either. I don't know. We need to get we need to get some good guests on. This well, show. I was thinking of bringing on a couple of friends from college, and then you had an idea for a guest, which we won't tease, obviously, because we can't be certain. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, but there's a mystery guest coming, maybe mystery, yeah. in a couple of episodes. Big guest. A big guest, and then I was going to have a couple of uh, cinematographers, designers, maybe even some photographers. So, I mean, this is a part of the episode where it's like, you know, I would ask you what projects you're working on, but I think we talked about it initially. Mm-hmm. Like you, we talked about how you're working on the box office artist, and you're working on a couple other like. So you, yeah. do you upload weekly? Which at which channel do you upload to weekly? Well, I decided to to not only to only focus on one channel this time, so right. that you yeah. know it keeps things simple, and um, you can actually grow the channel, have a better chance at growing the channel. Right, and I think, and I think my intention with this podcast is to help you grow that channel by including you in episodes mm -hmm. you know the red current entertainment's the sponsor of the of the podcast um, no i mean yeah we're trying to build dr masaki right yeah yeah so and, uh, that's the plan yeah i mean we we made an update video back in 20 end of 2019 saying you know 2020 is gonna be a big year we're gonna bring do more bollingston films but that didn't happen, so I think we're going to push that to this year. They're Ballingston films. We should do Blue Inflatable Ball Part 3. three and, and Rookie. And The Rookie. Yeah, yeah that's true. I think 2021 is going to be tougher than 2020, who said? Oh, yeah. yeah. 2021 is going to be tougher than 2020, who said? Who said? WHO. Who said? Oh, who said? Oh, who said? Yeah. World Health Organization. Yeah, who said? 2021 is going to be tougher than 2020. Who said? Who said? Who said that? Who said? That thanks, Kevin, just... for being on this episode. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Cameron, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me in your in your studio. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's our creative space. It's our creative space. Um, and it's so freaking hot today. It is really freaking hot. Thank so uh, you. thanks, everyone, for listening to episode two of Framework. Yeah. Make sure that if you still have not seen Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, check it out. And depending on where you are listening to this, it might actually be in theaters. If that is the case, go watch it in theaters. It's the best way to see the movie. You can watch it on Prime Video as well. It's available on Prime Video. Yeah, or in YouTube also. Thanks everyone. We'll release first Monday of every month. All right. Take care and stay safe. Bye.